You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Canada's status as an actual soccer nation isn't exactly long-standing. But even so, fans had come to expect big things from the Canadian women's team at the Olympics and at the World Cup. The women's side of Canada's national program has been an unlikely powerhouse for more than a decade now. And that's despite players pointing to a lack of support and pay equity from Canada soccer and a lack of commitment to developing a women's professional league. For a long time, none of that mattered. Because the team itself, full of stars, led by legend Christine Sinclair, kept winning until they didn't. I think what you're seeing in women's football is teams are catching up. Uh, I think this, for me, is a a wake-up call for back home, Uh, a wake-up call to our federation and the lack of a professional league, uh, the lack of resources for the national teams, the lack of resources for the youth national teams. that... That was Christine Sinclair herself, explaining just some of the reasons the team flopped at the Women's World Cup in Australia last month. That was only, of course, after she pointed the finger at the team's performance. Right now, something seismic is happening in women's soccer, and the Canadian women's dispute with their own federation is just one example of it. Many teams are fighting for better pay, for better resources, for more support, And they are refusing to put up with the sexist behavior that has dominated the upper levels of soccer forever. The balance of power off the pitch is shifting, finally. When that happens, what does the future of the game look like? And how will the results of these long overdue fights for equality change the game in Canada and around the world? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Shireen Ahmed is a senior contributor to CBC Sports, a sports media instructor at Toronto Metropolitan University, and the co-host of the podcast Burn It All Down. Hey, Shireen. Hey, Jordan. How are you? I'm good. Is uh, Burn It All Down an accurate description of what's going on with Canada's women's soccer team and their organization? You know what? There's many times that I've felt like it's appropriate for everything in sports. But (laughs) to answer your question, there's moments where I feel like that absolutely yes. Well, last week, fresh off, if you can say that, a, a disappointing FIFA World Cup, Canada's women's team announced they won't be competing in the 2023 Panama Games. Why is that? So for everybody that doesn't know, the... Pan Am Games will be hosted in Santiago, Chile this time. But the problem with that is actually that the time of the the games, which start October 20th and then go to November 5th, are in the exact same time frame as an international FIFA window. And what that means is that's the opportunity when the players on the national team have an opportunity outside of their club commitments and are called for national duty. And this is something that's understood around the world in in global football, is that when your country calls you for duty, you go. So, I mean, I don't really love the way that sounds because it sounds militaristic and bizarre, but that's really what it is. When you sign on to represent your country, you go. That's a priority. So this happens to be during that time. And in the past year, Canada's had so few friendly matches or matches at all that it has, you know, it's one of the factors that was considered into the performance in Australia at the Women's World Cup. So getting as many high-level competitive matches from FIFA-ranked teams is actually a priority. So on a call with Bev Priestman, head coach Priestman said that that was actually something that they were looking to do. So not competing at the Pan Am Games actually makes sense. What are the issues, before we get to the Women's World Cup, which we'll talk about in a minute and sort of where this team and and soccer in Canada in general goes from here, you know, what are the issues or were the issues between the players and the organization? So one of the first ones that came out was definitely 
pay equity and remuneration. And this was not something that the women's team felt alone. They were mirrored and they've had a couple of statements in the last eight months that are paired up with the men's side as well. And they're everything from brand marketing, which is something that, I mean, you can't even find a women's team jersey. You can't find, you know, Steph Labe, who won gold with the Canadian women's team at the Olympics in 2020. You couldn't even get her jersey from our own country because it wasn't offered and she retired. So that's something that, you know, I think we need to look at that even the ways that money would be possible to make were shut off. And it comes down to a deal that Canada Soccer entered in with the CSB, Canadian Soccer Business, which is this organization that seems like very cryptic and mysterious and shady, for lack of better terms. And the players were not aware of this at the time. And because Canada Soccer was in such bad financial position, they basically gave a huge part of their profits for the next, it's like a 10-year deal with Canadian soccer business. And it's something that is legally binding. It's 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 a contract. They can't get out of it. And it's just been really messy. It's also been really, even as a sports journalist and somebody who knows all these entities, it was really hard for me. Like, I was making a chart on the wall. You know that meme of the person trying to figure out what was happening? Yes. That was literally me trying to figure out all the, the the players involved, like the big people involved and how it was happening. And I had a conversation with Jason DeVos, the Secretary General of Canada Soccer in May when he took on the new role. He's a former player and was part of the coaching staff in one of the Olympics with the women's team. And, you know, he was very clear that there was a lot of things, but the biggest thing that he said that had to happen was rebuilding the trust. And that's something else that's happened and has really marred the relationship between the players and the organization is trust. So it's not only bad-mouthing, you know, former President Nick Bontis is said to have used the term, you know, what was Christine bitching about when he's talking about Christine Sinclair, who's trying to advocate for the team and herself. And, you know, Christine Sinclair testified in front of the Heritage Committee in Parliament. Several players came forward, and this is all during a time where they're preparing for a Women's World Cup. So it's not only issues of remuneration, it was not a great relationship between the Federation and the players. It's things like cutting development team funding. It's cutting program, like greater, you know, performance team funding. And that's something that's really something that the players have often talked about is that if you start cutting the youth and development teams and those programs, who's going to fill in the spots for the senior team? It just becomes a cycle of mess. And that was something they had reduced camp and resources. And then Janine Bucky, who was a commentator in Qatar at the Men's World Cup, saw what the men were getting. And, you know, they had their own chef that flew with them and all these resources that she saw with her own eyes and obviously told her teammates, like, wait a minute, we don't have access to any of this. Those are things that I think came into play too. And these are all things that I think were being flagged for the last couple of years, but really, really came to a head. And in February of 2023, during the She Believes Cup, which is, you know, a really prominent tournament that was supposed to, you know, go before and ready them for the World Cup and give them an idea of, you know, matchups and who's playing and what they look like, they were emotionally and physically drained. They were exhausted at a level they shouldn't have been. Mm. And I found that incredibly alarming in so much that Sophie Schmidt said she was quitting. She ended up retiring completely after the Women's World Cup. But I remember watching that press conference and those players were in tears and it was very frustrating. As someone who loves the game and as a sports journalist, it was very sad and frustrating at the same time. I think I speak for every Canadian when I say I don't disrespect Christine Sinclair, first of all. <laughs> but thank you for all of that context, because as somebody who, you know, follows the game, but not closely, I hadn't realized the extent of the issues. Now that you've kind of given us all the background leading up to this World Cup, what happened in Australia? For me, the performance in Australia, they're just, the levels are getting higher and higher. And that's the problem, Mm. is that if Canada soccer can't help maintain that growth in Canada, we don't stand a chance in the future. And we saw a foreshadow of that in Australia. But the emotional and psychological baggage that the players had I don't think was shaken off. And this is all conjecture from my part after observing and seeing that part of the struggle for women's sport is you want to give these players the opportunity to just do sport. 
Right. They're out here advocating against sexual harassment for equal play, for opportunity, you know, for protection and safe spaces. They never get to just play. And that's what they're supposed to do. So in addition to everything else, you know, could have been a mental performance piece. They were visibly shaken in Australia. They didn't at all look like the same team that we've watched before. So it was it was disappointing and it was heartbreaking. They know that. So in the mix zone after the matches, professionally, it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was stand there and ask them. You know, <laughs> essentially, you're asking these players, these incredible athletes who you, you respect and you have a working relationship with, what happened out there? And they're in tears. Mm-hmm. I had to process a bit of what I would call grief is what I saw and what I experienced. And I think a lot of Canadians did too. Wow. I want to highlight one of the things that you just mentioned because I used to cover sports in another career, mostly men's sports. And one of the things that coaches will always hammer on is, you know, eliminate distractions, get everything out of your mind, be able to focus on nothing but the play in front of you and, you know, your hands and the stick and the puck or whatever it is. And then to hear you talk about all the contacts that these women are carrying into the most important games uh, that many of them will ever play. I can't help but feel like it would be debilitating. They're athletes, so debilitating (laughs) would be really difficult, right? But I think there was a lot. There was a lot happening. And, you know, they took accountability. And to see the social media posts, I remember Ashley Lawrence was like, I'm sorry, we're sorry. And we wish we could have been better. And it was on us. And even... Christine Sinclair on in the line at the mixed zone after the match was like, this is on us. There's other factors and we can have conversations about Canada soccer, but tonight was on us. But if you look at that and then analyze, you take a step back from it, you process it, you look, the year that they've had was turbulent. It was hard. And it wasn't somewhere where you want your team to be going into the biggest stage of soccer in the world. And this is why I hope, you know, where there's Olympic qualifiers coming up and leading up to the Olympics in Paris, this is an opportunity to sort of redeem yourself. But at the same time, soccer everywhere else doesn't stop growing. It doesn't stop, you know, being invested in. Just for example, England in the last 10 years, what I've seen from the Lionesses is an incredibly different, it's a different team. The whole country is behind them. They've won the Euros. They have an incredible coach who was awarded coach of the year by FIFA, Serena Wegman. And it's to see growth in that place is is great because you really do want the game to grow. But then why is Canada falling so far behind? I don't just want to talk about Canada while we've got you here, but I want to talk about the state of the women's game in general. You mentioned just how much the game has grown recently, perhaps not keeping up in Canada, but you've seen so much of that growth in the sport and the women's game in general across the world. You've been covering this sport for years. You were in Australia for the World Cup. What was it like to see that growth realized in person? Oh, it was electric. Jordan, it was You're right. This isn't meant to be a, we're so sad. This is a, hey, let's realize what needs to be fixed and fix it. Because the potential of soccer in this country is only mirrored by the growth of it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And to be in Australia, and this is my fourth World Cup that I attended, my third Women's World Cup. And to be in a place where the whole country is absolutely enamored with the co-host team. Like, I didn't get to New Zealand, but I was in Australia. And the whole country, you saw Sam Kerr, Haley Rasso, who's one of the players who wears the little ribbons in her hair, people walking around on the street with ribbons. You would see women's jerseys and women's kits everywhere. Like, it was, it was absolutely, it filled my soul with happiness. Because as somebody who lives in a country that isn't obsessed with women's sport, it was very cool to be in a place that was. And it was an honor to be there and cover it and give it the respect that it deserves. And that's what it's got. So to be there, it was just, it was incredible. And to see how, what Australia has done is really an incredible blueprint to take a team that wasn't as well known in a country where women's soccer is definitely, soccer is not the most beloved sport. It's Aussie rules football. So to to take it and, and, and to just lift it up in this way was just glorious. I was in France, and it certainly didn't feel like that in 2019. I was in restaurants all over Paris, and nobody even knew there was a Women's World Cup happening. And that was even when France was playing. And it was like 
so frustrating. And then in Canada in 2015, I mean, it was something similar. The NHL playoffs were happening at the same time. So you could, you know, the, whatever, the attention span was was sort of divided. But mm-hmm. it was it was beautiful. And I only see it getting bigger and better from here. As it continues to get bigger and better, how hard are the players who are at the core of the game going to have to fight to make sure they get what they're owed as the game grows? And I mean that both in terms of the fights for pay equity that Canada, obviously, but also uh, the American players and, and other nationalities have been through. And I guess just in terms of the the way these world-class athletes are treated, and I'm obviously referring here to the president of Spain's National Soccer Federation forcing a kiss on a player in the immediate aftermath of the championship and just how the tournament that you just described, which is so wonderful and such a huge step forward, can then be smeared by this kind of stuff and how hard the women had to come back and and fight against it. Yeah, that's a a really good way to say it. My friend uh, Meg Linehan, who writes about women's soccer in the U.S., she used a word that I think about all the time, and she said hijacked. Yeah. And former, and I say former because he resigned last week, Spanish President um, Luis Rubiales hijacked the moment. He took a moment of glory away with his recklessness, his disrespect, and his misogyny, and he, he literally just took over the moment. The conversation thereafter wasn't about how incredible Jenny Hermoso's performance was. It was what would happen to her. And, you know, she had to navigate being on the global spotlight, her teammates and those that stepped away from the team in order to advocate for themselves as well. There was a number of players who were not on that roster because of their own principles and protest. You know, they had to rally around her. And it wasn't anymore about how they played. That's what I wish I spoke about. That's what I wish my columns were about. It wasn't about that. It was about, you know, this this act and not just this act, everything leading up to it and how men in the women's soccer ecosystem really take up and hijack many things, safety, money, power, and control. And he was he's reflective of not just that moment. He's reflective of so much that's wrong. Jamaica had to had a parent set up a GoFundMe because they couldn't go and they're at odds about money. They haven't even been paid by their federation. Nigeria hasn't been paid. You have issues in other places. And, you know, like it's constant. The coach of Zambia had allegations of sexual misconduct and he went and Bruce Arena coached. Like what is happening here? You know what I mean? Like it, we we hold on to these moments of joy because we have to. And it's a form of resistance, and we must in order to go forward. But at the same time, that doesn't preclude us from sitting back and going, we need to fix this. We need to make this better. We need to put that happiness and that that justice back in sport again, because it's not happening with who has the reins at the moment. How do we do that? What needs to come next? One of the things that that happened in the aftermath of that kiss was a, a really incredible show of solidarity from women's players across the globe. And how do you translate that to a movement that does make uh, the game more equitable and safer and and more equal? So I'm part of a podcast that's called Burn It All Down. Oh, right. <laughs> so- <laughs> So my so that's visceral the solution. reaction, that's, the, but that's but it's not just about my co-host Dr. Mira Rose Davis said something that really hit me. It's not just about burning it down. It's what we build afterwards. And right now, what's happening is we're trying to build from these things. We're trying to build up from the stuff that has collapsed or burned down or been torn down. And that's for me what the vision is. Let's put people there who are visionaries, who are guardians of the game, who are trustworthy people. I'm not a believer in only putting women in positions of power for women's sport. I think we should have the best people in there. Absolutely, they're definitely women. They're definitely non-binary. Like, let's put the best people who really have that vision for this. And traditionally, there's a lot of corruption in in football in positions of power. Let's let's not do that. Mm. <laughs> let's have people who are honest about the game and want to see it advance. I mean. What is really this about? And women 
players and media professionals and coaches don't get into women's sport for the money. Now we know it's lucrative and it can the numbers and the ratings are amazing, but you go into it because you truly love it. There's so many things that we can talk about that are positive, like the business side. And that's one of the reasons I also think we definitely need to think about what's being offered media-wise as somebody who teaches sport media and sport journalism. You know, we know how little of it is covered in in newsrooms and let's sort of wake people up and talk about it, not just talk about the professional leagues, talk about local leagues, talk about what's happening in varsity campuses. Let's talk about what's happening, you know, in, in grassroots levels and our semi-professional teams and our leagues. And so there's so much that we can choose from and so much we can help We can help build and help amplify. Those are just some of the things in my head that like, these are things we can all do. We can support it. Mm -hmm. There's one thing I do want to stress here if we're talking about respecting sport in general and women in sport. Don't do it because you have a daughter or a wife or you're the son of a mother. Do it because you care about the sport and care about people. You should care about protecting women and having them have safe spaces, not because you have a daughter, but because you respect people. And it shouldn't have to center you in it. Like, I respect them because I have a connection. You should do it just because you're a good person and you don't like violence against women. Like, that should be enough. So this whole rhetoric of, you know, I have daughters, therefore I care. That's, I mean, we need to retire that too, Jordan. No kidding. One last question. What's next for the Canadian team and Canada's soccer Specifically, I guess I, I know you can't predict the future. What will you be watching for over these next several months? So there is an, there's two Olympic qualifier matches against Jamaica. I think that's where we start. That's where we look at what's happening and we qualify for the Olympics. That's amazing. We'll look at the the year ahead. It'll be planned out meticulously. Now there is a possibility that Jamaica, who have historically we've beaten in every matchup, they may win. They are a completely different team. They're energized from their performance. I mean, they advanced beyond the group stages. They went to round of 16, which Canada did not. So they are. They have some top-class players, some Ballon d'Or um, nominees. Bunny Shaw plays for them. Like, hmm. this is a really, really good team. Right. And that's another thing, as I've already noted. We have to look not just at how we're growing. We have to make sure our growth is at par better than everyone else's. What are we doing? What kind of players do we have? How young are they? What's the depth of our bench? What does it look like? How, what does the staff look like? Are they getting the support and the resources that they need? Look at the direction that the Federation is heading. What does it look like? What are their ideas? Are they rebuilding those relationships with the players and the fans as well? That definitely can tell you how many fans were deeply disappointed in what happened. People were really angry. And there needs to be a transparency above everything else. There needs to be transparency, something that we were lacking and something that Canadians deserve and something that the government also said we want to see more of. So, you know, we have a new uh, Minister of Sport as well. And hopefully the minister will be doing, you know, her job, her due diligence as well. And I think there needs to be a lot more attention on the way things and processes are handled. That's what I think. Shireen, thank you so much for this. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Shireen Ahmed, senior contributor at CBC Sports, instructor at TMU, co-host of Burn It All Down. That was The Big Story. For more, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca or, of course, you can find us on Twitter at the Big Story FPN. You can write to us, hello, at thebigstorypodcast.ca or you can call us, 416-935-5935. We're available in every single podcast player you could possibly imagine if you find one that we're not in, please email us, call us, leave a message, let us know. We want to be where the listeners are. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.